All right, let me set the stage for you. It's 216 BC. The army of Carthage has just penetrated into southern Rome, led by the vicious warrior Hannibal. Consuls Lucius and Vero have amassed an 86,000 large Roman infantry unit plus cavalry to meet them. Now, given Hannibal's trickery in the past, the Roman army has chosen an open field where they could see any forces that were trying to hide. On this field, on the southern border, or what we shall call left, is a river that is too wide to ford. There is no hope of escape if the Roman army wins. Now, given the weakness of Hannibal's army, the Romans have decided to cast their lines into three deep lines of 86,000 troops flanked by cavalry as the usual Roman fighting style suggested. Yeah? Is the answer elephants? No. <laughs> there is no answer. This is a question. Hannibal has decided to put his weakest infantry at the front, mostly made up of Gauls and Spaniards. On the sides, he has flanked on the right his Numian light fighting cavalry, and on the bottom half, his heavier Hispanic cavalry. He is vastly outnumbered. However, Hannibal ends up winning the battle decisively. It is a crush. Parts of Italy defect towards Carthage away from the Roman Empire. How is Hannibal able to do this? The Roman army uh, exhausted, so taking out the weakest members of his army, so that the heavier units were able to easily kill them. And he was on the higher uh, side of the hill, so his cavalry were able to gain up on the other cavalry mm -hmm. and cut them down as well. Very good. The most important part of this is strategy. Strategy. Hannibal sends out his front weaker infantry first. When the army first goes out, they're shaped like a crescent, like this, meeting the Roman infantry here. When the front meet, the Roman infantry advance as their orders were directed. Hannibal directs a controlled retreat because Hannibal has stationed himself in the center. The crescent concaves backwards. However, Hannibal's strength was his cavalry. The Roman cavalry kind of sucked, much like most disadvantages. They were able to cut through the Roman cavalry on the flanks fairly quickly on the left border facing the river. The only retreat option was for the Roman cavalry to go into their infantry, which clustered them. Eventually, the crescent, which was shaped like this, became a pincer formation like this, with the Roman army trapped in between. In such close quarters, they were not able to wield their weapons effectively, despite their superior fighting techniques. Hannibal stationed his much stronger infantry on the smaller sides of the cavalry, and they were able to cut them down very quickly despite having a size disadvantage. Debate, like war, is about strategy. This lecture is about pro tips regarding that strategy. You would not go into battle without ammunition. You would not go into battle without a well-trained army, contingency plans, or logistics. In this lecture, we will discuss the difference between tactics and strategy using some military metaphors and discussing some historical examples. There will be two parts of this lecture. Most of you will be interested in the second one. The first part I've labeled preparation. Preparation. The second part is how to crank bigger and more high rep teams as a smaller school or a lower rep team. At some point in all of y'all's debate career, you will be debating a very large team, a team that has a history of success. You either have no coach, no card colors other than yourself, and you may barely have a partner. If you utilize the tips in this lecture, that won't matter. 
Preparation. It is said that if you know your enemies and know yourself, you will not be imperiled in a hundred battles. If you do not know your enemies, but do know yourself, you will win one and lose one. If you do not know yourself, nor your enemy, you will be imperiled in every single battle. Does anybody know who said that? Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu. That's a very rough translation. Victorious warriors win first, then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and seek to win. That's also Sun Tzu. Preparation. Before tournaments. What are you supposed to do before tournaments? Any ideas? Yeah? Prepare your cards and prepare your blocks. Prepare. prepare your cards and your blocks? What's the utility of that? You know what you're, like what you're reading and what's yeah. in it. You gotta know yourself, as Sun Tzu has taught us. What are your arguments? What are the strengths of your arguments? What are the weaknesses of your arguments? We've discussed this fairly briefly in our lab, but in order to prepare against what the other team is likely to say, you have to know what the strengths of your arguments are and the weaknesses of your arguments are. The way you go about doing so is by cutting the cards, highlighting the cards, reading them, organizing them into blocks, so you can efficiently deploy them in debate rounds, much like Hannibal deployed his cavalry. Hannibal knew his strength vis-a-vis -vis the Romans was the quickness of the Spanish horses. His weakness was the unorganized fighting style of the Gauls. He allowed the Gauls to die, and the Spanish lived. Yay, Geronimo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Work smarter, not necessarily harder. Work smarter, not necessarily harder. I am all about the hard work. When I first started debate, I sounded terrible. I was kind of mean. People didn't really like me. But I worked a lot harder than almost everybody else, which gave me an advantage. I didn't sound the best. I do now. We'll talk about that later. Know your affirmative. When you're negative, prepare generics. Highlight and prepare these files so you know them. Now, what if you don't have all the time in the world to cut cards because you have both soccer and cheerleading practice on the same day? What if you don't have time to highlight and cut cards because your parents are making you do practice SAT tests and write college essays a year in advance? Nico. What, what should you do? You work smarter, not necessarily harder. If you only have a limited amount of time to devote to debate, make sure that time you do devote will give you the largest advantage when preparing for debates. Work smarter, not necessarily harder. Now, what is a skill or part of debate tech day that will apply every single year that will help you advance to elimination rounds more often and will make judges like you better? What, what part of debate is that? It doesn't have anything to do with content of argumentation. What part of debate is that? Yeah. Conduct. Hmm? General conduct. General conduct. What about conduct within debate rounds? What, what do we call that? Yeah. Speaking. Speaking. <laughs> speaking. How do we get better at speaking? Speaking. Practice. You practice. The number one thing you can do when you don't even know what the next year's topic is going to be, you don't even know what your affirmative is going to be, you have no idea what any of that will be, you can practice speaking. You can do this before tournaments. It will help you sound better. A way to bolster the effectiveness of this exercise is record yourself. Many of you will find this extremely uncomfortable. One of the most difficult things I've ever had to do is watch myself get schooled in a cross-ex by a team that just I donated ballots to like it was my job, like I was expecting a tax return for my charity. I gave them ballots, and watching myself in cross-ex, watching myself speak against this team was painful, especially because I did it with Turner, and that made me sad. <laughs> Give practice speeches. Once you've highlighted and prepared your files, is the work done? No. The first speech you give on any new argument, you will suck. 
It does not matter if you cut the cards, if you highlighted the cards, if you phone called the authors of the cards and had an hour long chat. It doesn't matter. You will suck when you first give that speech. Give practice speeches. You can do this by yourself. If, as we discussed, you know the weakest parts of your arguments and you know the strongest parts of your arguments, you can easily craft what a 2AC or a 1NC would look like. What's the negative team going to say against this affirmative? What's the 2AC going to do in response to this negative off case position? Imagine it, deliver it. Give practice speeches and record them. Now, this is for people who have multiple members on your team. However, it is also for people who live in local areas where they know the other people. If you're a member of the Atlanta Urban Debate League, or if you're a part of the local circuit, you can coordinate with other schools to meet up on a Saturday night when all the other kids are out clubbing. You can have a practice debate. Oh, yeah. Right? Right? I know, right? Yes. Self five, right? That is what I call a hot Saturday night. Afterwards, you get to go bowling. Even more fun. Or play a board game. If any of the young gentlemen are wondering how I woo people, it is with bowling and board games. Know your strengths and know your weaknesses. That is a tool for life, not just for debate. Do practice debates. If you have six kids on your team, that's two more than you need for a practice debate. Get the other two to judge. If you only have two people on your team, email the entire local area. Try and set up a time. Meet in one of y'all's debate rooms. Ask the administration to have a teacher be there to let you into the school so you have a place to do it. Or just do it at your house. I've had practice debates at Kirk's house. Seriously. Like, I've just gone over there, done a practice debate, then we went bowling. Hello? What's your name? Hi, Daniel. You're on camera, Daniel. <laughs> Richards. Do practice debates. If you are not creative enough to think of what the 2AC will say to the new counter plan you cut, give a practice debate. Have a practice debate. Have someone else come up with one. Because if you're just like, oh, there's no good answer to this, chances are there is, and you're just not creative, and or you have not known yourself and your enemy. <laughs> Last but not least, scouting. Scouting. Before the Battle of Canae, literally the night before, Hannibal's army, or parts of it, they sent out scouts, and they just stole and destroyed water supplies of the Roman forces. So when the Roman infantry arrived, it was hot, it was dusty, the Romans' position on the battlefield meant that the sun was shining directly into their faces, and they were thirsty and dehydrated. The psychological effects of that were should not be underestimated. Similarly, know what your opponent is going to do. Don't steal their water. Don't do that. Don't do that. I've actually heard some pretty traumatic examples of this involving a person in the debate circuit who had diabetes and then one of my teammates in high school was just like, let's give him a Danish before this debate round. And I was just like, Jesus Christ, no, stop. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> but scouting. Does anybody know what the wiki is? Yes. Yeah. The wiki? Yeah. It generally has most teams on it. Almost all the teams will be on there. If you're a member of a UDL, then you will know the people you're debating. You can talk to them, email them, call them up on the phone, don't text them. <laughs> phone calls, it's weird, right? They used to be connected into walls. What? I <laughs> Please tell me that was sarcastic. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not old enough to have those references. Hi, Matt. I like a cat shirt. He knows his strengths. Worst turner when we need him. I like your punctuality less, though. <laughs> 
Yeah, that, there's that. That's a weakness. We'll work on him. He's in my lab. Wait, rewind. What's the address of that website? Can I ever remember it? The website? Uh-huh. Uh, I don't have the exact link pulled up, but ask your lab leaders about it. The high and, school one? Yeah, the high school one. Just HS type it. HSPolicy.DebateCoaches.org. HSPolicy.DebateCoaches.org. Cool beans. HSPolicy.DebateCoaches.org. And if you're really, really, really desperate, there's this thing called Google A. And you type into it, NDCA debate wiki, high school policy debate wiki, something like that. And it'll, it should pull up a link. Before tournaments, you can go into it at least knowing something to expect. If you have a particular rival or nemesis, you can plot to defeat them. We will discuss ways for smaller schools to do that in just a second. During tournaments. During tournaments. As Sun Tzu has already taught us, victorious warriors win first, then go to war. What should you do in your downtime at tournaments? Prep. Prep. Scouting. Prep. Or scouting. I like all those things. Also, eat plants. Green vegetables, cruciferous vegetables. They'll keep you healthy and strong during tournaments. Drink water. Things to not do. Look for french fries. Look for candy. That will spike your glucose levels in your blood. When it crashes, you will feel more tired than you have ever done so in your entire life, because you will also be debating. That is not the path to victory. During tournaments, number one, scout. Almost every school I know of, even ones without coaches, have novices. They have people who are interested in debate. Teach them how to flow. Teach them how to listen to debates. Get them excited and then bring them to tournaments even if they're not debating. Even if they're not debating. Use younger members of your team who are excited to help to go watch other debates and scout and figure out what your opponents are saying, are likely to say, so you can better prepare during your downtime to defeat them. There's a parable on the Emory debate team. This occurred so long ago that nobody really remembers when, starring a young man named John Holland. He's kind of a legend. I've never met the fellow, except when bowling and playing board games. His name was John Holland, is John Holland. John Holland did not sound the best but he worked the hardest. John Holland cut cards, but more importantly, he cut the right cards. How do we work smarter, not harder? We know what our enemies are going to say. That way, when he wasn't doing computer science or playing StarCraft, he was able to cut the best strategies to best meet his opponents at tournaments. He would literally run around the tournament figuring out what everybody was going to say. When he first arrived in college debate, he was not the best. He was also not the worst. By his senior year, he cleared at the NDT with a freshman. He beat the top five team in the country during prelims of the NDT because he knew what they were going to say and he knew what he wanted to say against them. He knew his enemy even better than he knew himself because of scouting. Listen to the parable of John Holland and you shall have much success. During your town time, what are ways to prepare? Not a rhetorical question. What are ways to prepare during your downtime? Yeah. Speaking drills? Yeah, you can even do speaking drills in your downtime. I recommend when you first wake up in the morning, you know, after showering, you're getting dressed and stuff for the tournament and hopefully after eating. Do some speaking drills. Do like five to ten minutes of speaking drills before your first round even starts. So when you walk in, the guns are blazing. Yeah. Well, I could do is I like to argue, like, to get my speech. I like to argue people where I take the disadvantage of, like, pro stereotypes or something. So you kind of get your brain thing. You can do that. I like the first part of that, not necessarily the second part of that. I would say yes, pro argumentation. 
give practice speeches on positions that you've prepared. I would recommend trying to get the creativity going before the tournaments. Use your downtime to cut updates, to highlight files that you may not have gotten to, and to, if you weren't able to give a practice speech on a position that you finished maybe two nights before the tournament and you were really tired and you just didn't really get to practicing it, give a practice speech. Have your partner listen to it. There's a lot of downtime at tournaments. Now, what you shouldn't do is use this in replace of eating. You need to eat and you need to drink lots of water. The last thing you can do at tournaments, after your debate is over and you have lost, you should just throw things at your judge and heckle them, right? No. 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 What should you do? <laughs> yeah. Write down what your judge is telling you. Take notes. Ask questions. Something that John Holland did was he emailed basically everyone who judged him during the year. He emailed them and got more advice. He was pretty OP. Overpowered. Um, the element in debate that Sun Tzu could not have predicted is that there are adjudicators of the battles that we involve ourselves in. If Sun Tzu knew about debate, he would no, undoubtedly would have said, know your judges as much as yourself and your opponents. Know your judges as much as yourself and your opponents. Why is that important? If you know your judges, like you know what they're likely to vote for, what their like pet peeves kind of are for mm -hmm. debaters, and like what you can do to get their vote. Mm -hmm. You can increase your speaker points with particular judges. You can identify what they think are strategic arguments in debate. And you can all around interact with them better because debate is not just you present your arguments, judge calculates and decides. It, it is an interaction. There are some judges who we will, will even comment on what is going on in the debate rounds. The head coach at Harvard, I really like him as a judge. Uh, sometimes you can even ask him what you should go for in the two and R's. Be like, hey Dallas, what should I go for? Should I go for this counter plan? And we'll just look up, shake his head, be like, not a winner. Nope, not with me. And you can even get feedback like that. Judges are humans. They want to interact. They want to be interacted with. Do so in debate rounds. Know your judges. Not in the biblical sense, though. <laughs> Preparation after tournaments. After tournaments. Now, because I like sports and I don't care who knows, what do quarterbacks do, and even all members of the football teams do, on Monday or Tuesday after their NFL games on Sunday? What do they do? Yeah? In the bed. They watch film. They watch film. Film of what? Like her? Or frozen? The game. They watch. They do, what do they watch? They watch their opponents. Yeah, they watch themselves. They watch themselves. Yeah, you had your hand raised in the back. I'll get to you next time. I promise. They watch tape of themselves play. If you can access like a video recorder, a camcorder, much like the one we've been using to record us get these lectures to post online. You can record your self-debate. You can review your self-debate. What's the best way to get to know yourself? Observe yourself. I, I can't hear anything that any of y'all are saying. Observe yourself. Yeah, observe yourself. Watch yourself through the eyes of hopefully a neutral observer. Through the eyes of a camera. Or even an audio recorder. I used to carry around an audio recorder all the time in high school and I would record my debates and then I would just like listen to them on the bus. I didn't have many friends. <laughs> 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 like you play bowling and bowling games all the time. Oh, don't be sorry for me. I was awesome at debate. <laughs> <laughs> she said the allies joke. <laughs> Nikhil, <laughs> you are both wise. What? It's the one who on that ballot. <laughs> <laughs> it's the name on my notes for the yeah. selector. Oh, that's wonderful. I didn't, 
The negative team in the demo debate did not get many negative ballots, as you all may have suspected. However, one of the ballots that we did get was for the negative. Because Nikhil is my ally. <laughs> and I am yours, good sir. <laughs> Know yourself by watching yourself through the eyes of your opponents. If you were to debate yourself, how would you beat you? How would you go about beating yourself? When you've come to that answer, work on that. We all have a psychological motive to work on the things that we are already good at. I don't need more practice cutting cards. I need more practice highlighting cards and delivering speeches. So I should work on those more than on cutting cards. Cutting cards is important, but in terms of relative skill, I'm better at that than other things in other parts of debate. I should work on the things that I'm worse at. A way for me to discover that is to know myself. Had Hannibal not known himself, he would have met the Roman army in the exact same formation. The skill of the Roman infantry in the center would have destroyed them because they were up against a river. They would not have been able to retreat. Hannibal, knowing himself, his strengths and weaknesses, was able to use the Romans' expected terrain advantage against them. Now, you should also review the notes that your judge gives you the advice that your judge gives you. How many of you take notes when you've won a debate? How many of you take notes on the judge's advice to the losing team, or do you just wait for the judge to talk to you? And I'm getting a little wet, I'm getting a little wobbly. Any ideas? What should you be doing? No. Oh. Right? One day you will lose a debate. The best year of college debate from the past decade, that team still lost 10% of their debates. <laughs> Bless you. Even that team lost. They won way more than they should have because of the weaknesses of Stephen Wheel, but they still lost. I'm just kidding. He, he, was, he was also OP. Not as much as John Holland. They still lost 10% of their debates. You will be on that losing end. You might even be on that losing end going for the same exact strategy as the negative. You want to hear what the judge's advice for that strategy is. Also, the judge's advice might allude to weaknesses in the negative debaters and their debating. If the negative is not taking rigorous notes on that, or the opposing team is not taking rigorous notes on that, you should. That's a good way to know your opponents. Hello, friend. Yeah. Part two. Debating as a small school versus either a larger school or a school with bigger rep. Let me set the stage for you. The year is 480 BC, in a hot August and or September. I'm not clear on the exact details. At Thermopylae, an army of 7,000 Greeks, led by the Spartans, of course, amasses at what is known as the Hot Gates. This is the only road through to get to the heart of Greek territory. This is the second invasion by the Persian forces led by King Xerxes I. It is estimated that their army ranged as much from 100,000 to 1 million. I err on the side of 150,000 because I think that's fair. And it still works with my story. 150,000 Persian troops arrive to battle 7,000 Greek forces. How long were the Greek forces able to hold the hot gates? One week. One week. 
How long is the average debate tournament? Three days. Four years. Four years. Saturdays. Four years. Slightly over 24 hours. One day to three days. Can you hold your terrain for one to three days if 7,000 Greeks led by 300 Spartans were able to hold an area against an army that was over 10 times as large for a week? Yes. Now, the Greeks did eventually lose this battle, but they won the war. Debate is a marathon, not a sprint. Debate is a marathon, not a sprint. The Battle of Thermopylae should be used as an example of the advantages of training, equipment, good use of terrain, and strategy as force multipliers. It is a symbol of courage against overwhelming odds. How many of you feel that way when you're debating larger schools with larger reputations? Raise your hand, throw them up high in the air. You know who's that larger school with the larger reputation? It's me. I am hella privileged, which is why I'm your ally. My senior year, however, the only people cutting cards were me and one of my coaches, which is still more than many of y'all have. Plus, I was obviously way better at debate than y'all. Utilize your advantages as a smaller school to topple your foes. The number one advantage you can have, the number one advantage you can have is argument asymmetry. What does that mean? You've answered a lot of questions. <laughs> what is argument asymmetry? Any thoughts, ideas, musings, queries? You've still answered a lot of questions. So have you. Yeah, you. I mean, information asymmetry, like knowing more than your opponent? Knowing more than your opponent, that's an example. In debate, what is the hot commodity? Cards, arguments. New or It's time. Timers. It's time. <clears throat> you have a set amount of time to speak, so does your opponent. However, within that speech time, how much are your opponents devoting to certain arguments? How much can you devote to that certain argument and then try and make the debate all about that? Speed is the essence of war. Take advantage of the enemy's unpreparedness. Travel by unexpected routes and strike him or her where he or she has taken no precautions. Sun Tzu. Here are ways to do that when you're affirmative. Write an app where there are a limited number of possible negative responses. Write an AF where there are a limited number of possible negative responses. What do I mean by that? Yeah, Richard. Um, uh, it would be harder for the negative to argue back. Yeah. Yeah, it would be harder for the negative to argue back. What are some other thoughts? You've still answered a lot of questions. You in the beanie? Yeah, so they're not going to be able to take you by surprise. Yeah. Uh, they won't be able to take you by surprise. If I know that my affirmative is questionably topical, all of us will read an app like that at some point. If I know that my affirmative is questionably topical, and I know that the best negative strategy against it is topicality, is that going to stop me from reading that? No. Why? Because topicality. Because you know what they're Because hmm? you know what they're because you know what they're reading. If you know what they're reading, what can you do? Prepare, prepare for it in advance. So you can you pre know. prepare for it in advance. If a lot of teams are going for that against you, what will you get more experience at? Debating topicality. 
If my app is questionably topical and two thirds of the time the team against me goes for topicality, two thirds of my two ARs will be defeating this T violation. By the second or third tournament of the year, I will be debating teams who may have never gone for this T violation, and if they have, only a handful of times. In terms of skill, what to expect from judges, how to frame the debate, I have an argument asymmetry. I know my arguments better than my opponents. I know my opponent's argument better than they do. I know how judges react to this argument better than they do. Like Leonidas and the rest of the Greek forces, they knew the terrain of the hot gates better than the Persians. It was not until a Greek traitor, he who shall not be named, Voldemort, <laughs> pronounced in Greek, Affiliates, <laughs> showed the Persians a secret path which allowed them to get to the rear of the Greek forces. Leonidas, knowing that this traitor had spoken, dispatched away most of the forces and kept a little over a thousand troops there to guard the rest of the Greeks' retreat. The Greeks were able to rebuild their forces and defeat the Persians eventually. Know yourself, your opponent, and how to beat them. Another advantage of knowing your app is you can do the most research on it. My senior year for the first semester, or most of the first semester, I read an app that sent up one telescope. One telescope into space. The cards on this were dope. We even read F from Bill Nye the Science Guy. <laughs> like, seriously, redonkulous. How many negative responses do you think there were to sending one telescope in the air? <laughs> Not many. Well, limited amount. There was also a limited amount read. I had a Google update, so every single time there was an article written about the James Webb Space Telescope, I was already emailed it. I read those articles. When the negative had read an argument specific to my affirmative, I had already read the article that they were reading. I knew its strengths and its weaknesses. Conduct yourself in the same way. Know yourself, your opponent, and if you're a 2A and the 1A, know your F. If you want to be strategic about it, make sure the affirmative is smaller so your opponents can maneuver less against it. Like the Greeks, you can narrow your opponent's options. You can choose the terrain for them and increase your probability of victory. Several ways to do this on the negative. What's your favorite argument in debate? Yeah? Topicality. Topicality? Any other thoughts? Genres of argument? When I asked Turner this question, he just said the link because he's a little hipster debater <laughs> with amazing pants. What are what is your favorite argument in debate? Yeah? What? Critique. Critique debating. Any other thoughts? Everybody thinks tea and critique debating are their favorites, yeah? Uh, the winning argument. Oh, the winning argument. Okay, that's cheesy. Marsh? The dissat. Cool. Steven and I, we have the favorite argument in debate. We share this. Impact turns. What's an impact turn? Yeah? When you say that what they're claiming is the impact, the opposite will actually happen? Uh, the opposite will actually happen. If I said that warming was bad, what would be the impact turn to that? The ad causes warming. Uh, that's a very, that's a type. That warming is good. Raise your hand if you are fully prepared to defend that warming is in fact bad and not good. Y'all are all liars. I would destroy you. <laughs> Impact terms. Teams really suck at defending their impacts. As we discussed before, the hot commodity in debate is time. Teams spend in the 1AC and 1NC very little time devoted to explaining and defending their impacts. They might read one card, maybe two. However, they have claimed that they solve it. If 30 seconds out of an eight minute 1AC is devoted 
to explaining and describing one impact and three to five minutes of the one in C is explaining why that impact is in fact a good thing. Have you constructed an argument asymmetry? Yeah. Yes. What does the affirmative now have to do? Or 2AC. But instead of the affirmative having the head start, you can flip that and give yourself the head start as the negative. Compile impact turns. Work with other schools and other members on your team. Prepare these. A day will come when I will finally win a debate on proliferation good, despite having gone for it five times and lost every single one. The day will come when I finally win a debate on that. What's well, another advantage of being able to pick and choose which parts of the affirmative you want to engage? Oh. Yeah. Effective time trade-off against the negative? Yeah, for the negative. The negative can pick and choose which parts of the app they want to engage. Two other argument options that I think are extremely beneficial. Advantage counter plans. Teams will often have evidence that says that their affirmative is sufficient to resolve their impacts. Rarely will they have evidence that says that their affirmative is necessary or the only sufficient option to resolve their impacts. The awesome thing about advantage counter plans is that every not topical mechanism and even sometimes topical mechanisms are advantage counter plans. If you're the negative and you win that you deserve fiat, which is very difficult to do, you can prepare advantage counter plans. If you email college debaters, or look for open source files on the College Debate Wiki, you will find advantage counter plans a galore, especially if you go to Emory's, because we do advantage counter plans and impact terms like it's our business. If you email those college debaters, there's a pretty decent chance that they will email you the file. If I get a thousand emails because of that, I will be very frustrated. <laughs> A thousand new allies. <laughs> like the Arcadians yeah. and the Spartans. Arcadians, Spartan, Steve. Because <laughs> <laughs> the joke the other day where they said that you were one of the weakling Spartans that just happened. Yeah, I was one of the weakling Spartans that happened. Weakling Spartans. Bless you. Are you the one that likes Russia? <laughs> <laughs> I will not go into that with you. Rush. No. No. <laughs> the third right. argument that you can gain a general asymmetry for the negative on are critiques. <coughs> are critiques. Many of y'all are smirking, just like, oh yeah, I got critiques for days. That's all I do. I'm way good at it. I know philosophy. Turner said Derrida one time, and I knew who he was referring to. Nice. <laughs> Y'all all suck at going for critiques. I'm just telling you that now. But here's the benefit. Critiques evolve. Critiques evolve. Critique answers rarely do. The critique answers, which were read by affirmatives, in 2003 are the same ones, generally, that are read against teams now going for critiques in 2014. Critique answers rarely evolve. They rarely evolve. If they are static, what does that make them? Easily, like, predictable. Hey, who said it over there? Naved, yeah, that's what's up. Sing it next time. Predictable. They is be predictable. Hella predictable. I'm trying to talk with the kids these days. 
they are predictable. If they are predictable, what can you do? Research them and find out how to beat them. Research them and find out how to beat them. Exactly, kid whose name I do not know. <laughs> exactly, kid whose name I do not know. You can research them in advance, before tournaments, during tournaments, after tournaments, on your birthday, and find out what they are and how to beat them. If you are a small school and you are looking for argument asymmetry, you have a limited amount of time and you are the two in. Cut impact turns, advantage counter plans, critiques. Impacts rarely change, they rarely evolve. List a couple of impacts that y'all know of that actually get read. What? <laughs> what? Extinction. Okay, extinction. Uh, I mean, well, we're not going to go there. Extinction. Nuclear war. What are some other impacts? Like, just like, prolif, ecological collapse, widespread power, economic collapse, bioterror. Uh, bioterror. Ooh. Oh God. Yeah. South China Sea. Conflict. How about? Oh, South China Sea conflict. How about water wars? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Space force. All right, that's enough. That's enough. That, what do I mean when I say that's enough? Stop. Yeah. Girl whose name I do not know. <laughs> Why am I girl whose name that you don't know? But he's kid. He's like, oh, I was gendered. I apologize. <laughs> you can have impact turns to all of these if you invest your time wisely and you work smarter rather than harder. If you know your enemy and your enemy is generally very generic and predictable, like the Romans, you can defeat them, even if you have a much smaller force, like Hannibal. Invest time in cutting DDEV. Invest time in cutting Warming Good. Most of this evidence is already online in cut card form. Unhighlight it, then re-highlight it. Prepare these files. If you are a small school and you need to, there is nothing better to help you succeed during the regular season. Now, the last thing I want to discuss is how to deploy these in rounds. And there is kind of just one concept behind this. Choose your opponent's argument for them. Choose your opponent's argument for them. How should one go about doing this? Yeah, Morgan. Specifically undercovering certain arguments you want them to go for. Okay, you can incentivize them to go for certain arguments by undercovering them. But if the point is to gain a time asymmetry, doesn't that kind of hurt you if you spend less time on it? The answer is yes. Other other ways? Yeah? Drop the Boy, arguments. whose name I do not know. Drop the arguments you don't want them to go for. With like this. Okay, no, because then they'll just go for them and beat you on them. Uh, yeah. Set things up as like voting issues with them, like the one I see. Okay. Has any of y'all ever heard of a straight turn? Yes. yes. What is a straight turn? Not called in this area a lot. Nikhil, yeah, my boy, um, my ally. What's it's up? When you um, read a turn, but you do not read the other argument that would let them kick out of their position. So they are forced to go with it, otherwise you have an advantage? Yeah, that was slightly vague, but let's concretize what that means. Yeah. If the affirmative reads the China wind disadvantage against your offshore wind affirmative, the impact is Chinese economic collapse. And the 2AC then says Chinese economic collapse is good and only says that, does the negative have to go for that position? Yes. yes. Why? I've already called on you a lot, and you a lot. Dude from Russia. Not from there, unfortunately. Uh, spiritly, <laughs> you are. Are you from Canada? You. You're from Canada? <laughs> oh, your holes are cool. <laughs> <laughs> so if they concede it by not countering it, they didn't give you an advantage. Uh, if they concede it, but what? It, why do they have to go for it if the 2AC only says that the disadvantages impact is actually a good thing? If they don't counter it and prove that it's a bad thing, their, their whole arguments. Yeah, they, they lose. They have to say that their impact is in fact a bad thing. 
because the affirmative has conceded that Chinese, the Chinese economy will be okay due to their offshore wind industry now. The affirmative has conceded that they lead to the collapse of this industry, and they have countered the only negative argument that they need to, that Chinese economic collapse is bad, it's actually good. What have they done? What has the affirmative done? Yeah. Made it so that the affirmative causes something bad instead of helping stop that bad thing from happening. The reverse. The affirmative has said they call something good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. They call something good. They have chosen what the negative has to go for. They have strategically conceded certain arguments and shifted the debate to a terrain that they are well prepared to go for. Now, a little parable for you. My freshman year in college, I was debating with another legend named Matthew Pesci, also known as Poisson. That's French for fish. Now, Poisson, cut an affirmative, where the best disadvantage against it was the politics disadvantage. We read this affirmative 12 times that year. We won 11 of those debates. In those 11 debates, in the 1AR, we straight turned the politics disadvantage by going for a link turn, not necessarily an impact turn. This is, we can get into this in specific lab groups later. Sorry, other lab leaders. We went for the argument that the plan actually assisted in the passage of the legislation that they were claiming was a good thing and that we interfered with. We won that 11 times because in the 1AR, we straight turned it. We made sure it was the only argument that the 2NR could go for. And because of that, we got an asymmetric time trade-off vis-a-vis the block in the 1AR. If the 1AR is able to do that, going from the most time-pressured speech and debate to utilizing that against the negative, you will have great success and win many battles. The 12th time we read this affirmative, the other team had scouted what we were doing. They learned that this is all we were able to do, and they did not read the politics DA in the debate. We got cranked. Oh my god, it was the worst loss I've ever suffered in college. Like, by far the worst. Shows you the utility of scouting. Choose your opponent's argument for them. Make them pay. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. When attempting to scout, how does it do you do it? Do you, you, you use social skills and speak to people, or do you just like watch them with binoculars? <laughs> 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 I suggest the <laughs> Okay. You steal their laptop. <laughs> All right. Uh, good and interesting question. Those two are usually mutually exclusive. Don't use binoculars. Uh, Use extendable ears that you can buy at Wizard, uh, Weasley's Wizarding Weezes. Uh, because it's more important for you to hear than see, because unless you can read lips, that will not be very important for you. Talk to judges. Talk to other teams. Talk to teams' opponents. What happened to the debate? How did the certain team win? Talking to judges that judge other debates, and you can figure this out just by looking at pairings from old rounds, so like hold on to your pairings at debate tournaments. You can figure out what happened in a round. What was the team that lost weak at? What was the team that won good at? And also weak at? If you're a small school and you have limited time at tournaments, it's better to do this before and after tournaments. Hold on to the pairings. Figure out judges' emails. If you don't know, email people that you do know and try and find out. Judges are unbelievably receptive to good questions. They want to help. They've invested time in the debate activity because they care about watching good debates, judging good debates, and coaching good debaters. Unlike y'all, they have a long-term investment in the debate activity. They want to see it grow and remain healthy. 
Utilize that to your advantage. Now, one last story. If all else fails, then bluff. Sun Tzu was once trapped in a castle with only like 300 warriors. And he knew that the approaching army was coming and that they would get cranked if they fought. Sun Tzu said that if you cannot win, then you must retreat. However, he could not retreat. What did Sun Tzu do? He bluffed. Sun Tzu went to the top of the castle wall, burned some incense, wore robes, and started playing the pan flute. Sun Tzu had a reputation at this point. When the approaching army came, they saw Sun Tzu doing this, and they were just like, he would not be doing this unless he were really prepared, and they left. When you get really good at impact turns and certain arguments, you will get a reputation for that. Teams will start constructing their arguments accordingly. So against us, my partner and myself, teams often take out their best impacts because they're afraid of getting impact turned. This leaves them with much weaker impacts. Cultivate this reputation. Scout to find out what teams will do against that reputation and then become more flexible because of it. Nick Miller once lost a debate on a really terrible diss ad one time. Nick Miller's weakness was that he was pretty not great at cutting cards. When they were debating this team again, they still did not have answers to the diss ad. Don't do that, always be prepared. However, one of the Emory coaches took out a thumb drive, went over to Nick, the thumb drive was empty, and said, Hear the answers to that diss ad very loudly. The other team heard, read the DA. Nick in the 2AC was just like, this diss ad is horrible. I don't need to read any cards. Here are all the arguments that we will make with cards in the 1AR if they extend it. The negative then kicked the deal. <laughs> if, all else fails, if all else fails, bluff. Hopefully, not all things will fail. <laughs> if all things fail, learn the lesson from your failure. And my last piece of advice for all of you, the most important thing you can do is have fun with it. You will not remember the judges, the advice, the rounds, the arguments years after your career is over. You will remember the laughter and the funny stories and hopefully Hannibal's victory over the Romans <laughs> and the noble stand of the Spartans at the hot gates. I bid you all good luck.